Good morning and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today for the 19th uh, speaker as part of our joint webinar series between Binghamton University and uh, VIT uh, Velor. We are very delighted today to have uh, a faculty member from System Science and Industrial Engineering at Binghamton University who will be speaking today. Today's speaker is Dr. Yenge Zhao, who received his PhD in, from the Department of Industrial Manufacturing and Systems Engineering at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas in 2020. Dr. Zhao earned his bachelor's in mechanical engineering and business administration from Shantan University, China in 2014, and his master's degree in industrial engineering from Texas Tech in 2016. His research focuses on microfabrication and hybrid manufacturing of 3D biomimetic architecture for biomedical applications. He made a major contribution to developing an innovative electrospinning strategy that includes rapid assembly of aligned 3D fiber scaffolds, which create a biomimetic environment to facilitate uh, cell morphogenesis. He also conducted pioneering work on the integration of silver nanoparticles and microcurrent of antimicrobial ultra filtration membranes. His most recent work focuses on rapid fabrication of nanoporous microtubes as artificial capillary vessels for tissue engineering. Dr. Zhao has published more than 20 refereed journal papers and conference papers. His teaching interests include manufacturing systems, uh, additive manufacturing processes and systems, and biomedical design and manufacturing. And he's also a member of IISC and ASME. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Zhao to our webinar series to speak about electrospinning uh, spinning biomimetic scaffolds for tissue engineering. Dr. Zhao, thank you again for uh, joining us and I will turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Kasoni, for your introduction. Um, good morning, everyone in the US, and good evening, everyone in India. And uh, also, good afternoon, uh, Professor Bruno from Italy. So, I'll go ahead and share my screen. So, uh, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, as Professor Cassoni mentioned, uh, my name is Inge Zhou. I'm an assistant professor from System Science and Industrial Engineering at Binghamton University. I joined Binghamton University at uh, 2020 and my research focused on tissue engineering. So today's topic will be about uh, electrospinning biomimetic scaffolds for tissue engineering. And uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, here is the outline for today's topic. Uh, first, I'll introduce some of the background in terms of the tissue engineering and uh, electric spinning. And then I'll address the research need as well as uh, research methodology and uh, go through property characterizations as well as potential applications. Finally, I'll go through summary and contribution as well as uh, part of my future works as I will do uh, in my future career in Binghamton University. So first, uh, when we have an organ failure, uh, the first option we'll think about is always an organ transplant. However, there's always uh, less donor uh, compared to the body who needs uh, donation. So we also face body rejection issue when we are transplanting from someone else or uh, moral conflicts when we're transplanting from animal models. So in this case, um, tissue engineering emerged in the last few decades to address those challenges and risks. Tissue engineering is an interdisciplinary field to improve or replace tissues or organs with engineering methods. Its global size uh, is about to reach 53 billion by 2024. So in order to repair and uh, improve uh, organ tissues with engineering methods, first we need to isolate the cells from human body. And then we also need to expand cells and fabricate some 3D scaffolds to develop a tissue. After we have the cells and scaffolds, 
The last important factor will be biological factors, such as growth factors. So as industrial engineers, uh, I focus on the fabrication of 3D scaffolds. So out of all of the tissues in our human body, nanofibrous tissues has come to our special attention um, because there are many natural tissues that has fibrous structures, such as tendon, ligament, bones, muscles, and cartilages. Um, those tissues are related to a major um, uh, range of disease, such as osteoarthritis, muscle atrophy, and tendinitis, as well as um, cardiovascular um, disease. So those diseases are, are infecting more than 50% of uh, populations in the world. And uh, we need to figure out a way how to mimic these fibrous tissues. So as we know, nanofibrous structure can mimic the extracellular matrix morphologically and architecturally. So in this research, we can see that in the artificial manufactured nanofiber structure, the cells attached on the scaffold and were elongated uh, and were contained in a 3D meshed structure. And they were, the cells were growing aligned along the scaffold fibers. We also know that aligned fibers can trigger signaling pathway and faster cell migration. So based on this research, we see integrating signaling pathway were triggered in uh, normal human dermal fibroblasts when we are uh, fabricating aligned fibers. So aligned fibers can also show higher mechanical strength since they are all aligned in one direction. So in this um, research, it shows significantly imp increased imp expression of tenomodulin and exhibited uh, aligned fibros, which increased EO stress and Young's modulus of the cell CD scaffolds. So as you can see, not only the mechanical strength of the scaffold can be enhanced, the cell CD scaffold will also have improved mechanical strength. And uh, now that we know that uh, aligned fibers can mimic the native fibers tissues, and uh, they are very beneficial for cell growth as well as mechanical strength. How do we fabricate um, cell scaffolds that are fiber structures and aligned as well as in 3D structure and uh, uh, with gradient features? So because uh, here is our research need because nanofibrous structures are persuasive in musculoskeletal tissues such as tendon, ligament, cartilage, bone, and muscle. And also there are some gradually changed features in 3D space that are common in musculoskeletal tissues. If we take a look at the uh, ligament and tendon, we'll see the uh, fiber density as well as the fiber alignment as well as the cell alignment will gradually change from one end to the other because those tendons or ligaments are connecting between bones and between bones to muscles. So the rapid fabrication of nanofiber scaffolds to recapitulate the microstructure of extracellular matrix in native musculoskeletal tissues becomes our research need. So the uh, research methodology we're introducing here is electrospinning. Electrospinning is a very common uh, way or uh, has been adopted for several decades to fabricate nanofibers and microfibers. So when the high uh, voltage potential applied on the po uh, polymeric solution needle tip, the solution will be pulled into a cone shape by electrical force. When the electrical force exceeds the uh, surface tension of the liquid, there will be a liquid jet coming out from the solution needle tip. So as the po polymer jet accelerated and stretched by the electrical force, the jet diameter will decrease as the evaporation due to high vapor pressure of the solvent. And finally, the jet will become smaller and smaller and we will get nanofibers and the micro size fibers on our collector. So the advantage of electric spinning is that it's 
versatile for almost any soluble polymers. And uh, it is low cost process that can be easily scale up and the nanofibers uh, can suitable for cell culture. So electromagnetic can fabricate several uh, tens or hundreds meters of nanofibers in a few minutes. So it can be very really efficient. However, uh, the fibers are always in random orientation and the scaffold thickness is always smaller than one millimeters. So which means they're in 2D scale uh, or in a matte structure. And there's always limited uh, mechanical properties compared to other uh, such as 3D printed or bioprinted scaffolds. So how do we overcome those um, disadvantages when we are using electric thinning to fabricate nanofiber structures? Um, there's many uh, research endeavors has been done to do that. Um, we have post treatments such as freeze drying and cross linking to make the scaffold um, in three dimensional and more porous. Uh, or we can use 3D printing to print uh, one layer of FDM printed scaffold and another layer of electric spinning fibers to enhance the 3D structures and uh, with the nanofiber structures. However, all of those structures don't have any 3D uh, nanofiber structure with aligned nanofibers. So our strategy is to use a special collector that was specially designed for our research project. So in this um, collector for electric spinning, we have two conductive aluminum bevels on the side of the collector. And those two bevels are inclined, not horizontal. So we have some inclination angle on the collector. And the bottom of the collector is not conductive. So first we 3D print this um, shape using a normal FDM 3D printer and then adhere several layers of aluminum uh, foils into the uh, bevels, onto the bevels. And then we'll place this um, special collector on our uh, platform beneath the electric spinning spinnerate. So the spinnerate will be placed on the center above of the collector and uh, the fibers will bridge between the two bevels from bottom to top in a additive manner. So our hypothesis is that the diverged electrical field will cause the whipping fibers to bridge between the two bevels and to form a 3D nanofibers scaffold. And in order to validate the hypothesis, um, a simulation of the electrical field has been done using Flex PDE software. So as you can see, the electrical field gradually changed from a round shape to a two bevel shape. This validates our uh, hypothesis that the electrical field has been diverged to a two bevel shape. And after uh, the validation of our hypothesis, we uh, select um, PCL in DMF and chloroform solution 15% uh, weight to volume ratio, and uh, we optimize the op pump rate, voltage, and tip to base distance, as well as electric spinning time to fabricate the scaffold. As you can see in the video, the fibers uh, are bridging between the two bevels and are forming a 3D aligned uh, nanofibers scaffold. And uh, the fibers are collected both onto the bevels and between the bevels and continuous deposition increased fiber density. Now that we have the scaffold, we want to know uh, what kind of effect can affect the fiber diameter or fiber density as well as fiber alignment. So in order to investigate the effect of collector geometries on the fiber diameter, fiber density, as well as fiber alignment. We designed a factorial uh, experiment that include two levels for um, collector width, two levels for collector height, as well as two levels for collector inclination angle. So totally we got eight uh, different collectors and we fabricate eight different scaffolds. 
So now that um, there's eight different scaffolds, it is very hard for us to use the microscope to characterize the fibers since they are in 3D scale. And uh, the microscope um, focusing range is smaller than the fiber, than the scaffold uh, size. So we need to figure out a way to convert the fibers in 3D scale into 2D scale. So the uh, measures we're adopting here is to use different glass slides with double side tape to insert from top to the inside of the scaffold and swipe horizontally to collect the fibers in different sections. So for example, for this one collector, we used four glass slides to section the scaffold into four different sections. And after we horizontally swiped the collector, we'll obtain four glass slides with different um, nanofibers from bottom to top. And then we'll measure the fibers on each glass slide from the bottom to top and separate um, the glass slide by one millimeter distance. This means for every one millimeter, we'll take a, a microscope or SEM image to characterize the fibers. And uh, after uh, fiber diameter analyze and uh, microscope, we'll see that the fiber diameter averagely range from 260 to 1000 nanometers. This means all fibers are micron, are sub-micron level or nanofiber level, nanoscale level. And uh, we can see for fiber diameter, if we increase the collector width and height or decrease the collector inclination angle, we'll always get bigger fibers. And if we take two scaffolds with different inclination out, uh, inclination angle out from the uh, eight different collectors, we'll see that um, the fiber with lower inclination angle will have a significantly higher fiber diameter. And you can also see from the SEM image that the fiber diameter, uh, the fiber orientation are highly aligned, which means we successfully fabricated aligned scaffold with uh, the uh, scaffold with aligned nanofibers. And uh, for these two collectors, the diameter ranged from uh, 100 nanometers to 730 nanometers. So what about the gradually changed features that uh, we just mentioned to mimic the native tissue such as tendon, ligament that has gradually changed features from one end to the other? Well, so we separate our scaffold into peripheral error and central error, and we compare if there's any fiber density and fiber alignment difference between the peripheral error and central error. So when we take a look at these two different collectors with different inclination angle, we can see that the fiber density for central error is always uh, lower compared to the fiber density for peripheral error. This means we have more scaffold on the peripheral of the uh, collector compared to the inside of the collector. And we also noticed as the height of the selector increased from one millimeter, 1.1 millimeter all the way to 7.7 .7 millimeter. The difference between the peripheral error and central error also increased. This means uh, when we are looking from bottom to top, um, the fiber density are gradually changed um, compared to peripheral error and central error. However, for the 135 degree collector, the gradually changed pattern is not that obvious. So this means that the collector inclination angle can change the um, gradient pattern compared to uh, preferred error and central error in terms of the fiber density. So what about the fiber alignment? So it is, um, first we need to define how to measure the fiber alignment. So for example, we have four different glass slides for one collector and uh, we took one SEM or microscope image at 1.1 millimeters uh, height difference. So after we have so many SEM or microscope images, for each image, 
will use the image J to analyze if there's a dominant fiber orientation. And if there's a dominant fiber orientation, how many percentage of the fibers are within plus or minus 10 degree of the dominant orientation? That's the 20 degree range. For example, uh, for point A, which uh, we do have point A here for um, 135 degree collector and peripheral area and at 7.7 .7 height, millimeter height. For this point, we took a SEM image and we found out the 92% of the fibers are within plus and minus 10 degree of the dominant orientation. So we say this point or this area is highly aligned. And uh, for this um, point B, we only have 20% of the fibers are within plus or minus the dominant 10 degree of the uh, dominant orientation. We say this point or area is lowly aligned. So after we have uh, alignment data for every point or area, we can plot the uh, alignment gradient features for every collector. So again, let's take a look at the, these two different collectors with two different angles. We can see for 120 degree collector again, the central area has lower alignment level overall. However, the distance between, uh, the difference between peripheral area and central area gradually increased when we looking from bottom to top. This means the inclination angle can also change the alignment level from bottom to top of the scaffold. So we also did a MATLAB plot to plot uh, every uh, fiber density and alignment point, see if there's a significant change when we are changing the collector height and width. And we found out that there, there is an increased collector height showed gradually changed on fiber density, but there's no significant effect on fiber alignment change. So uh, after um, we investigate the effect of um, collector geometry, we found out that the peripheral area always have more fibers compared to the central area. So this means the central area of the scaffold may not have efficient fibers cell to growth. So we are wondering if, uh, if we increase the uh, solution viscosities or solution conductivity, can we overcome the electro electrostatic impulse, repulse force between the deposit central fibers and the peripheral fibers so that we can deposit more fibers in the central area and get a more homogeneous uh, scaffold overall but we still want the gradient features, of course. So, and also we're just curious if we decrease the solution viscosity, will we still get fibers in 3D space? So here is why we uh, designed a, another experiment that with different levels of the solution viscosity, as well as different levels with solution conductivity. So how can we increase the solution conductivity? We incorporate um, different percentage of the silver nanoparticles into our solution to increase the solution conductivity. So as you can see, we have 5%, 6%, 7%, 10%, and 15% PCL solutions. And we found out that when the solution viscosity or concentration is lower than the uh, 7%, we cannot get fibers between the two bevels in 3D space. We can only get fibers onto the two bevels. So this means there's a threshold viscosity level for our solution to, to form a fibers uh, in 3D scale and bridge between these two bevels. And uh, we also measured um, the viscosity level in different shear rates. Um, we have three different levels of shear rate, 61, uh, 61, uh, 73, and 122. For these three different shear rates, we do not uh, observe significant uh, difference between the viscosity values. This means our solution 
is a non neutrino fluid and uh, the viscosity level will be consistent no matter what's the uh, shear rate okay and uh, after we uh, have all of these scaffolds and the solutions we characterize the conductivity of the solution as you can see when we incorporate the silver nanoparticles into the solution we can observe the silver nanoparticles however surprisingly for the, uh, the silver nanoparticles did not increase the conductivity, but actually in decreased the conductivity of the solution. So our assumption is that the silver nanoparticle uh, reacted with the trace element in our polymer solution. And uh, all, of, all of those conductivity values below, point, uh, below one micron simons per centimeter cannot be um, accounted as conductive for uh, usual applications. So uh, we also did um, electric spinning to fabricate the scaffold and we can see there's some uh, silver nanoparticles on our fibers. And then we did a EDS uh, analyze results to uh, validate the silver nanoparticles in our nanofibers. As you can see, the, um, the silver is um, obvious or can be ob obviously uh, observed in our EDS results. The gold is due to the gold spotting coating uh, before the SEM image. So uh, for the fiber diameter and fiber density analyze, we can see that when we uh, increase the fiber, uh, the solution viscosity or increase the silver nanoparticle uh, concentration, we can get always get bigger fibers. But if we increase the silver nanoparticles from 0.5% to 1%, the fiber diameter actually decreased a little bit and the result in some bond, bonding uh, fibers that are larger than two microns. So this is not a ideal result. This means the silver nanoparticle concentration cannot be higher than 1% in order to avoid the uh, bonding effect for the fibers to form a, a, a micron size fibers. And for, for the fiber density, uh, we separate the scaffold into top, middle, and bottom sections. And for the uh, top, middle, and bottom sections difference, we can see when we increase the uh, solution viscosity, we'll get um, higher fiber gradient which means the difference between top section to uh, bottom section actually increased. However, when we increase the silver, nano, silver nanoparticle um, concentration, you can see that the difference between uh, top section all the way to bottom section actually decreased. This means if we want to increase the homogeneity of the uh, uh, fabricated nanofiber scaffold, we can decrease the solution viscosity or we can increase the silver nanoparticle with um, concentration. And if we want to get a scaffold with more gradually changed features from bottom to top, we can either increase the solution uh, concentration or decrease the silver nanoparticle concentration. And finally, we did a cell culture to validate uh, our scaffold or silver nanoparticle is not harmful to the um, cells. So, so the cells cultured here are human fibroblasts. And after seven days, we can see that the cells already growing along the fibrous structure uh, orientation. And uh, for uh, the solution viscosity and conductivity uh, measure, we can see that uh, here is a formation for 3D nanofiber structures that was influenced by the solution viscosity. And there's a threshold viscosity level for generating 3D fibers. And that threshold is higher than generating uh, fibers in 2D space. And adding a uh, silver nanoparticle actually decreased conductivity and density gradient surprisingly. And higher uh, silver nanoparticle con concentration led to the weight of fiber exceeded the upward electrostatic repulsion result in more homogeneous fiber distribution. Because if we did not 
at the silver nanoparticle, then the fibers will have static, um, electrostatic repulsion force that will uh, repulse the fibers from depositing to the bottom and central area. And cells were attached and grow along the fibers even, even with the silver nanoparticle incorporated. So finally, uh, we have some potential applications for this uh, project. First, we can uh, modify the um, conductive area on the two bevels to fabricate different uh, micro, microscopic shape of scaffold. And we also fabricate a four bevel scaffold to obtain some mesh structures in 3D scale. And this can be potential scaffold for multiple types of tissues. And we also incorporate um, great, uh, hydrogel as well as collagen into our uh, polymer solution. And after we electrophilling the PCL and the collagen composite fibers, we incorporate this whole scaffold into hydrogel. And after freeze drying and uh, separate the hydrogel from bottom to top sections, we can characterize uh, if there's the collagen gradient from bottom to top. And according to our EDS results, we see that there's a great gradually change from bottom to top for even for different characters with different angles, there will be different gradient uh, patterns. This can be a potential scaffold for sustainable drug release if we incorporate different drugs into our solution, or if we incorporate silver nanoparticles and other antimicrobial uh, agents in our, into our solution, we can also um, apply the scaffolds into antimicrobial uh, applications. And finally, we did a cell culture for our scaffold uh, to put uh, the whole scaffold into a culture, customized uh, cell culture beaker. And uh, if we put the scaffold uh, vertically into the beaker, we can measure if there are cells on top of the scaffold as well as in front of the scaffold. So after uh, 24 hours, the cells had already stretched uh, along the fiber orientation. And after seven days, we can observe the cell elongation both on the top of the scaffold as well as on the front of the scaffold. So this means the cells has been uh, growth in 3D space in the scaffold. And uh, the summary and the contribution is that the gradient of nanofiber diameter density and alignment can be controlled by the collector inclination angle. And the angle is negatively correlated to the gradient. And potential applications, including the change of microsco micros microscopic shape and element gradient scaffolds. The scaffolds provided a micro topographical cues to promote cell adhesion, proliferation, guidance, and morphogenesis in 3D space. So the conclusion is that we rapidly fabricate centimeter scale 3D aligned nanofiber structures that closely mimic native muscular skeletal tissues. And for the future work, the first future work is to fabricate artificial capillary networks for vascularization using a uh, core sheath electrophilin. So if we incorporate a core sheath um, spinneret into electrophilin system, and we can dissolve the core in DI water, so the core will be water dissolvable or soluble, and the sheath will not be water soluble. And after we dissolve it, we'll be able to obtain a nanoporous microtubular structures that is highly resemble to our human capillary stru structure. We can also obtain a uh, surface pores by uh, non-solvent induced phase separation. This means if we incorporate water vapor during electrophilin process, or if we're using highly volatile solvent during electrophilin process, then there will be a uh, water vapor in occupying the surface of the nanofibers, uh, microtubes. And then the uh, surface will leave some porous structures that is again, highly resemble to human uh, capillary vessels. So this is a ongoing project that we uh, uh, several preliminary studies and pilot studies 
has been done, but we still need to further optimize the process and culture cells to see if it is really ben beneficial to cell culture. And the next um, future work will be hybrid biofabrication platform. In this platform, we'll incorporate electric spinning into bioprinting and 3D printing system. So uh, after we have the nanoporous microtubular structures, we'll incorporate it into the uh, bio ink, which is the hydro for bioprinting. And uh, we can print the bioprinted uh, hydro into the gaps between FDM filaments. So in this case, we'll both have the high mechanical strength and uh, high printing fidelity for FDM, as well as the uh, biocompatibility advantage for uh, bioprinting. And we also have micro uh, nanoporous structures uh, or micro tube structures that can function as capillary blood vessels for cells inside of the hydrogel. So in this case, we can investigate the feasibility of managing microtubes into other 3D printing systems and also to validate the benefits of 3D microtubes from tissue engineering point of view. So this will be uh, concluded all of today's um, presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions and comments. So Joe, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It's uh, definitely nice to hear about your work and to learn about some of the tissue engineering uh, activities that are taking place in your lab. Thank you. Uh, at this point, you'd like to open it up for uh, questions. Again, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions. Yes, Prabhu, yes, please. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for letting me ask the first question. Uh, Professor Zhao, this is very interesting, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I want to know whether this technique of electrospinning uh, and related techniques can be used to uh, develop uh, skin tissues. Uh, so for example, a patient who has uh, burn injuries, uh, can this technique be used to develop artificial skin besides uh, biomimetic uh, scaffolds for uh, uh, tissues within the body? Sure. Uh, I think electric spinning has uh, very extensive applications on the wood dressing. So uh, for example, if we have a burned tissue, we can spray electric spinning fibers and uh, onto the skin directly and to form a protective mat. And because it's a nanofibrous mat, it can be uh, very uh, beneficial for the uh, skin to uh, heal and uh, uh, can be protected from the uh, infection. If we incorporate some uh, disinfection um, factors into the electric solution, and uh, we spray this nanofibers onto our skin will be very beneficial for skin uh, heal. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from anybody? If you're having any audio issues, please feel free to uh, type your question in the chat. While everyone is thinking about uh, questions, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, starting next week, uh, if you are uh, joining us from India, the presentation will start at 6 p.m. instead of uh, 7 p.m., uh, given the daylight saving uh, time in the U.S. So hopefully this will uh, allow our colleagues and friends from India to join a little early and maybe enjoy uh, dinner a little earlier than usual. So it'll be one, uh, one hour earlier for us and one hour earlier for our colleagues in India. Bruno, I'm not sure. I think in your case also it will change. 
Yes, also in my case, will change one hour before. Yes, one hour. Yeah. Because okay. in in Europe, the the time change is at the end of this month. Oh. The last okay. Saturday of this month, there will be the time change. Oh, okay. 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 Good. Hmm. Any other questions hmm. for uh, Dr. Joe? I could ask a second question. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, the thought that went through my mind was related to the uh, reliability uh, in the actual field. So, for example, we apply this tissue inside the body or on the surface of the skin. Uh, how long will they last? And, uh, <laughs> for example, how, I mean, is it going to be years uh, before they need a replacement? Is there any such uh, uh, research that uh, has been done? Can you please uh, throw some light on it? Sure, um, although the biomedical, biomedical application of uh, this electroscreening uh, technique may be not my research focus, but I uh, do have some um, reading about it. I think the first, the electroscreening fiber has to be biocompatible and uh, it can, should be decomposed uh, after several, probably I would say several months, and uh, it won't be harmful to human, even it's inside of the human body, because we're using um, biocompatible and uh, degradable uh, materials. So as for um, your question in terms of after what happened after inciting the human bodies or how long, exactly will take uh, that one I'm not really sure because um, it's not probably not my research focus. Yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Prabhu. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. Okay, so if there are uh, no questions, we can end the uh, session earlier this time usually we are a few minutes behind schedule and we ended up take, we end up taking a few minutes extra oh uh, there is one uh, professor uh, professor uh, kanna dasan from vit asking if you can uh, share your views on 3d printing of organs yes sure uh, 3d printing of organs is definitely a very fascinating field and a emerging uh, research area but I do think there's a few key challenges to be addressed before it can be um, scaled up or can be applied into uh, industrial. First uh, challenge is um, we cannot print uh, capillary vessels or even um, artery and veins inside of the printed tissues. It is very hard to do that while we are printing the organs, but without the blood vessels, the cells cannot survive inside of the organs because the culture mediums are just surrounding the tissue. There's no, um, no enough nutrition or transplantation of waste for the cells to uh, live or survive. The second one is, um, the second challenge is that probably um, a lot of researchers is already um, um, addressing it. So it's the um, composite materials. So because one tissue has a lot of different materials and a lot of geometries. So how to bring those um, different materials at one time and incorporate to each other using different printing technologies such as 3D printing, um, bioprinting, or even um, STL, um, steel lithography, and other uh, techniques can be incorporated together to uh, incorporate those different composite materials. 
so that we can better mimic the native tissues. I think those two challenges have to, has to be addressed be, before 3D printing of organ can be really uh, realized uh, in like clinical um, scale. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll just go through the chat again to make sure I don't miss any questions or comments. Okay, looks like there are no uh, no more questions. Dr. Joe, thank you again very much for your time. Uh, on behalf of thank Binghamton you. University and uh, VIT, uh, Dean Vasudevan David and I would like to thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today to talk about your uh, research. We definitely appreciate your uh, contribution. Thank you. And before we conclude, I'd like to uh, remind everyone about next week's uh, talk. Next week's talk will be uh, by Dr. Kanna Dasan, who's an associate professor at uh, VIT. Yeah, please ignore this time. It says, it says 7 p.m., but because of the daylight saving, we'll change it to uh, 6 p.m. But Dr. Kanna Dasan will talk about physical modeling of transparent oxide semiconductor TFTs. So I hope that many of you will be able to join us uh, next week to listen to Dr. Kanna Dasan's presentation. And uh, as usual, I will be sending out a recording of Dr. Zhao's presentation with a formal announcement about next week's uh, presentation. And please feel free to share, the, share this with your students, colleagues, friends, and encourage them to uh, participate. And with that, thank you very much again, uh, everyone. Have a wonderful uh, evening. If you are in India, a great afternoon. If you are in <laughs> Italy, and so enjoy the rest of the day all. here in the US. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank so. you. Thank you.